My name is Rondalyn Korlak. I'm Michael Brenner. Hi, this is Scott McCain. What's up, peeps? My name is Keenan. Hello, this is Anthony Fasano from the Engineering Management Institute. My name is Rachel Fish. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Finara. And you are listening to the Visible Expert. Visible Expert. Visible Expert Podcast. All right, welcome everybody to Season 2 of the Visible Expert Podcast. I'm John Tyerman. And I'm Kelly Waffle. And we are excited to be here again. Kelly, I'm excited to be back in the studio with you today. You didn't think we'd make it this far. (laughs) Well, here we are. Hey, all right. Nonetheless. And today we've got our our guy, Keenan, on. And man, is he something else. (laughs) You're right. He's very thought-provoking. He brings a lot of conviction and transparency into the way that he uh, gives advice around selling. So, Kelly, what would you say is your biggest takeaway from our interview with Keenan? I would say takeaways. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm not going to go into a lot about his book. You'll have to read his book, Gap Selling, which is very insightful. But some of the things that came out of our interview is... um, Keenan makes a point of letting you know that the average person doesn't try to be an expert, and uh, he thinks that that's overlooked. You really need to immerse yourself uh, and really realize the impact of becoming an expert, which I thought was really good. Uh, Another point that um, actually got me thinking a little bit is, if you're not a critical thinker, how can you help someone? So um, that's another way to to look at things. And then... Uh, tying back to his sales techniques and tips, uh, the, the thing that was really clear to me was that no two deals can or should look the same. And uh, I know that that's something that a lot of salespeople struggle with. So he addresses that in the podcast and in his book. So what were your takeaways? Well, I think that speaks to empathy and being able to relate to your buyers and their unique situations. Um, I love his concept of future state, and then he even asked us about a hypothetical scenario about going to prison that I think would be um, is it will be very interesting to the to the listeners here. Hypothetical is the key. I, that's right, exactly. And um, I like his favorite line, so uh-huh. you'll have to listen to the episode to hear what his favorite line uh-huh. is. Um, so those were my two biggest takeaways. Let's dive right into the interview. Why not? Let's give the listeners what they want. They got to strap themselves in first. Buckle up. Here comes Keenan. Our guest today is Keenan. Keenan is the CEO of a sales guy, an international sales consulting, recruiting, and training firm. He's also a keynote speaker, Forbes contributor, and award winning blogger. Keenan is also the author of the best selling sales book, Gap Selling. And as you will find out soon enough, he's very passionate about selling. Welcome to the Visible Expert Podcast, Keenan. Thanks, baby. Glad to be here. Keenan, here at Hinge, we define recognized influencers who share their expertise and experience in the B2B and professional services spaces as visible experts. And this podcast is focused on sharing the stories of our guests and illuminating the challenges and rewards to building a personal brand. Can you tell us a little bit about how your journey started to becoming a visible expert from your modeling days in South Beach to running a $300 million sales division to where you are today? So, yeah, I mean, I can, but I, I'm going to cut to the chase, right? Like, you know, modeling in South Beach and, and back in the day and, and, you know, only being in my third job after just three years of selling from being an individual contributor to managing 300 million in revenue in just three years. None of that had anything to do with being a recognized influencer. What did it was I decided to start blogging. In 2009, um, I just got tired of trying to find a gig because I was pretty young and didn't have that much, quote unquote, measurable experience as far as years are concerned. So every time I had to find a new job, it took me six, eight months to a year to try to stay at the level I was at or even to try to move forward because I was competing with people who were, you know, at the time, 10, 15, even 20 years older than me for the same size um, leadership opportunity. So I was like, fuck this. I'm tired of this. So I'm going to do a blog and I'm going to write every day about what it takes to manage sales teams, grow sales teams, um, you know, uh, drive sales teams, 
B salespeople, et cetera. And I did that for 712 days in a row, pretty much. Um, wrote a blog post every day. And little by little, day by day, month by week by week, month by month, and year by year, people started taking notice, and it, it just built on top of itself. So after two years, I was being, you know, identified as a sales influencer, or my blog was picked as one of the top, you know, sales blogs in, on the internet, and I was asked to speak at different events, and it just, from there, that's how it worked. So obviously, um, blogging has played a, a big role as far as getting that influence can you talk a little bit uh, more about like what you're doing with video these days? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I switch is a. Well, I guess I have switched. I mean, I still blog once in a while, not nearly as much as I should. But now I, um, I do a lot more video on LinkedIn. Um, I leverage LinkedIn Live, um, and it allows me to engage with my audience. Right. So, you know, blogging is more permanent. So you put it on there and let's say you got a handful of existing followers who read it right away, but then it sits out there as phenomenal SEO. And over time, people can find it. it's like a breadcrumb and more and more people find you and you can build an audience over time and they can read it when they want, blah, blah, blah. But after a while, I started realizing I have an audience and I want to be able to interact and engage with them. And LinkedIn was taking off and they added video and I thought, saw that as an opportunity. So I started creating videos on LinkedIn and then that just expanded my network and expanded my reach and just built on what I already had. So, you know, just another medium. And so to me, they're all mediums, whether it's video or blogging uh, or I don't know. Um, I don't know what I can't, why I can't think of another one, but, or podcasting or whatever. <clears throat> to me, it's, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not about the medium and it's more about the content. Can you create content that people value, that they can use, that they see as worth the investment of their time to read, listen, or watch. So, Keenan, what, what sort of skills or personal habits do you think help, create, help you create that great content or were helpful as you were going through and building your visible expertise? Um, I, I don't know if there's – you got to know your shit, right? I mean, look, <laughs> I, just, I, I piss a lot of people off because the average person just doesn't really – seem to care to be an expert in their space. They spend so much time trying to gain experience. Experience is measured in time, right? Experience is measured in, in, in days on the job or whatever. And I couldn't give two shits about experience. I want expertise. And so, you know, when I ever did a job, and to this day, when I do a job, or I'm a big skier and I ski or whatever, I am like Im immerse myself into that thing. And I want to understand how it works What's the connective tissue? What good looks like? What bad looks like? What are people? What aren't people doing? What is the, the the gray space? What's the white space? How can I go in there and make a difference? What do I disagree with? What is the pride or the tried and true that I think is stupid? And how can I explain why it's stupid? And how can we fix it? Blah blah blah. And so <clears throat> by becoming an expert in whatever the hell it is you do, you can then just share that. So that the skill is just being an expert and committing. To, to knowing more about your space than anybody else and knowing the impact of the things that you do have in your space or, you know, just knowing the whole thing so you can teach people. And most people just don't take the time. They go through the motions. They, they just accept what they're told. They um, accept the status quo. They, they don't dig deep. They don't ask questions. They don't have uh, intellectual curiosity. They don't leverage critical thinking and they just step one foot in the other. And so they really can't offer anybody any insight. They really can't offer anything anybody wants to know because they're not really paying attention. So to me, it's just about being an expert and then sharing that expertise in whatever particular um, format you want. I guess it's kind of like knowledge is power, right? And so it's just a matter of taking that knowledge and then articulating it in a way that folks can understand. Absolutely. Right there. Knowledge is power. People are desperate for knowledge, right? People, the more people in the know, the or the, the let me phrase it, the more in the know you are, the more people who want to get close to you or follow you or listen to you or talk to you. People are takers. And look, I don't mean that in a negative way, but people are takers. So leverage our taking, our natural inclination to take, leverage that for you. Give them something to take and they will they will follow you. Uh, let's shift uh, gears a little bit and focus on your book, Gap Selling. 
So you talk about focusing on the buyer, knowing what the buyer's desired outcome is, knowing what the buyer wants to accomplish. <clears throat> uh, what is the gap in gap selling and where does it fit in with this thinking? So the, the gap is the space between one's current state and one's future state. And basically what gap selling assumes or operates from is the premise on how we decide. So there are two fundamental elements. I don't know if they're psychological or whatever. That's over my head. But there are two, psycho oh, psychological, the two fundamental elements in the concept of, of buying. And one is change and one is the decision process. So when we look to buy something – or someone's selling us something, the first thing is we have to make a decision, and the second thing is we have to make a decision to change. Well, if we look and think about how we actually make decisions, it's pretty interesting. We make decisions like this. The very first thing we do is we assess our current state, and we ask ourselves, is our current state tenable or untenable for whatever particular reason? It's 100% subjective. If I determine that my current state is untenable, I then pick up my head and I look into a perceived or desired future state and I say, what do I want my current state to be because it's not this now, right? What could it be? And that's my desired future state. Once I understand my desired future state, then there's a natural thing I call the gap. And that is the size of the space between where I am today and where I am tomorrow right? Or where I'd like to be, right? In my current environment. So in a horrible, but yet easy to understand <clears throat> metaphor or a simile, think about someone who's been sentenced to jail for the rest of their life and they're 22. Current state, 22, in solitary confinement. I'm not leaving for, if I'm you no know, lucky, I'm not leaving for another 50 or 60 years. I'm stuck there, right? That's my desired few days to get out as soon as possible. Well, that's a massive gap. I would pay or do much anything to get out of that, right? So there, that's another way of looking to, to, to define the gap. Where I am today and where I want to be tomorrow and how big is that space in between? The desired outcome is what we get by, um, by crossing that gap, by getting over that gap. So someone who's in prison and wants to be out sooner, it, be, could, it could be because they want to start a family. They want to get away from all the violence in the prison. Maybe they want to get out and get revenge. I don't freaking know what it is, but that's the desired outcome, right? I want to get out of prison to do something or have some level of some outcome in my life. Um, and that's how they all play together. And that's, by the way, what people buy. People don't buy the tool. People don't buy the process. People don't buy anything. They actually buy the desired outcome. And if the desired outcome is not as big uh, or worth the what ha with the cost, they won't pay it. And that's why the gap is so important. Are you saying it's the salesperson's job to bridge that gap or to help prospects kind of understand or come to that light bulb moment of what their desired future state is? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. 100%. It's not only just the desired future state, because salespeople do that all the time. Too many salespeople sell to the desired future state. It's their job to get the buyer to take a look at the, the gap in the whole thing. Where are you today in comparison to where you want to be tomorrow? Too often, salespeople try to sell to the desired future state, and they don't really anchor them in the, in the current state. And so therefore, it's hard to actually measure the gap, right? So, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, God, I haven't, I've never used this before. I don't know where it just came from. But I used to ask this question, and this might help illustrate it. Let me ask you guys a question. Would you rather spend one year in prison, but nobody tells you that it's only for a year? So you have no idea when you're going to get out, right? So every day you, you, you're thinking you're there for a long, long time. Or would you rather go in prison for two years knowing you're getting out in two years? Does that make any sense? Yes. So you get to choose. Now, it's hard for a lot of people who aren't very smart because they can't separate. It's like, well, I'll just take the one year. I'm like, but you don't know. You can't. You can't. Right. right? You don't know it's when it's a lot of people can't separate that too, but the smart ones get it. You choose one, but the one you go in without knowing, you're in there only for a year, but you don't know that even on the very last day before you come out, you don't know you're coming out the next day. Or you get to go in for two years, but you know it's two years. Which one do you pick? Honestly, I'd probably want the certainty and want to know two years. I'll, I'll exactly. Yeah. Yes. I choose two years because it's predictable. 
Yes, be, and it's predictable because you know your current state and you know your future state, right? Right. You literally know them so you can you can process the gap and work through it. Even right. though you're getting out in less time, because you don't have that other piece of information, you can't process the gap. And so it's extremely uncomfortable. It's extremely painful. It's gonna. That, I, I, I'm convinced that one year is going to take a lot longer. Or what you'll do is you'll just assume you're never getting out and you just process some way to create some artificial um, uh, construct. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so that's the same concept of gap selling. If you try to sell to just the future state, people are not locked into the current state. So they have no contextual understanding of the mm-hmm. size of the gap and how important it is. Yeah, that makes total sense. So, hey, Keenan, let's let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about some objections that are pretty common, like the prospect posted us or our price was too high or the leads are bad. You know, you, you contend that these are not reasons for losing a sale. They're just excuses. Um, yeah, they're, they're absolutely excuses. And really, if you're losing to them nine out of 10 times, it's not because the objections are real or the price really is too high. It's because you didn't sell it correctly. So when you gap sell, if you get the current state and you get the future state correctly and you actually are able to to identify and quantify the desired outcome, there should be very few objections. Because if you realize that you cannot deliver on their desired outcome, you shouldn't be selling it. So there shouldn't be an objective, oh, you don't have XYZ feature. Because if you've gotten this far into the process, you should know that not having XYZ feature has no bearing on their desired outcome. And so therefore, it's, it shouldn't change their decision on buying the product. If it does have a major impact on their desired outcome, then you're an asshole for trying to sell it and letting it go that far. Same thing, <laughs> right? Same thing with price. If I know what their desired outcome is and that's not worth what I'm charging, then I should have gotten out a long time ago. And so when you gap sell – the number of objections that you face become so much more manageable and in many cases are avoided. There's almost no such thing as objections. And the few that you get is usually through a little bit of confusion and you just put it back on them and you can say, wait, I'm confused. You said that you're looking to accomplish A, B, C, and D. And that was the impression I was under. I'm confused why us not having this feature is a concern understanding it does not affect your desired outcome. We're going to get you to A, B, C, and D. Why does this matter? Right? And so it's so rare and you're not even overcoming the objection. You're putting it back on their lap and you do the same thing with pricing. You say, wait, I'm confused. You said that, you know, I'm making stuff. If you said that you you're losing $6 million a year because you're, um, you're, you know, a finance person is unable to track your invoices and we're going to be able to fix that for you and blah, blah, blah. And it's only going to cost you three grand a month. I don't understand why that's too expensive to get six million dollars back. You think it's just salespeople aren't good at selling in general? Yes, it's exactly what it is. They, people are too product centric. They're trying to sell their product. Businesses don't get this either, and they teach their people to sell their product. Look, I can prove it right now. I want you to I, I want you to think about every company that you've ever worked for or that you know of people that work for, and, and they have training. And I want you to guess. You guys tell me, on average, if a company has a week-long training, how much of that training is focused on the company history, the product and services, and the internal processes? How much? 70%. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say 80%. Okay. How much is focused on the type of buyer, the problems those buyers have, the environments that those buyers work in, the impact to the buyer based on those problems, the business impacts, and the root causes, what creates the problems that we solve in the first place? How much of time is spent on that? Not enough. 20%. Yeah. I, I would say you're being nice. Yes. Because even if they do talk about the buyer that's still in their terms, well, here's your ICP, right? And here's how our product helps them. It doesn't teach you what the problems are. They don't teach you what the root causes are. They don't make you experts in that buyer's world. So all we do is we focus on the product 24-7. And when you focus on the product and someone says your product is too expensive, you have no way of defending it. Yeah, I, you talked about this a little bit earlier. I I really liked in your book where you talk about your four favorite words are, I'm confused, you said. 
Mm -hmm. That's a, a great approach. So um, I don't want to cover that again, but I thought that was that was great. Um, what I like about it, what's really important for people to understand is what I like about it is you, you, this is not a tip, a cheap tip or tactic. Right. You just can't whip it out. You can only use it if you properly understand or understood or done a good discovery to know what their desired outcome is, right? What their current, what their desired future state is, what their current state is, and you've defined it all. You can measure it because if you can't do that, then you can't say I'm confused. Yeah. So there's a certain level of foundation that you need to set and you need, like you said, you need to quantify what that current and future state is, qual quantify that gap. And I guess that would determine how valuable you know, the bridge would be. Um, I really like, you've got a lot of really great tips in your book and, you know, you're making us think differently right now. And um, one of my favorite parts was the nine qualities of a gap seller. And for our audience, I'll, I'll just list them off real quick. Curiosity, critical thinking, empathy, problem solving, leadership, creativity, deliberate learning, coachability, and business acumen. Can you touch on why some of these qualities are important in a little bit more detail? Yeah. As I pull my own book down, right? Look, here's the deal. If you see the theme in the book, in the process, the gap selling methodology, it's all about solving problems, right? And then if I want to take a step further, it's about helping people solve problems. And if you're not a critical thinker, how do you solve a problem? If you're not creative, how do you help someone solve a problem, right? If you have no business acumen, from what context do you pull any value to help them solve a problem? If you don't have leadership, how do you get people to listen to you? How can you challenge people? How can you get them to follow you and listen to your recommendations and to change the way they think if you don't have leadership? And problem solving unto itself is problem solving, right? So those are all absolutely critical, absolutely critical to actually being a problem solver and being able to get people to change. And also empathy. Empathy is absolutely critical because you need it to get to, – to put yourself in their shoes. I think salespeople lack weight, weight – uh, lack – Empathy. They don't have enough empathy because I, I'll talk with salespeople all the day. I'm like, why should they buy? And the salesperson's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? You're trying to get them to buy something. You don't know why they should buy? Like, no. I'm like, well, what are they struggling with? I don't know. Well, why are they hurt? I don't know. What's miserable in their world? Say, I don't know. Then why the fuck are you selling to them? <laughs> like, well, it's my job and I'm supposed to be. No, like, no, you're not. Your job is to help people and you help people in sales by solving problems that they either knew they had or didn't know they haven't solved them in the most effective and efficient way possible to deliver a new desired outcome. That's your job. So if you have no empathy that allows you to feel for that buyer or, or understand what that buyer is going through, you can't ask good questions. You can't, un, you can't diagnose, you can't do half the stuff required in gap selling. Yeah. In your book, uh, gap selling, I was really intrigued by the CRM challenge you created. Can you explain to our listeners what the challenge is and why it's so important? You guys are good. You've done your homework. Well done. Um, <clears throat> the, the CRM challenge is pretty simple, and it's, it's this. Um, you're, you know, a peer or your boss or a manager or whatever goes into the, your CRM and pulls out an opportunity, a current opportunity with a current close date, and they read the notes, and without reading the name of the company – the name of your buyers or any really any real um, identifying information like that, you should be able to tell them what the opportunity is. So they don't go in and they don't say, you know, John Jones of XYZ company. They go in and say, this company is struggling with disparate systems because of these disparate systems. They are losing, you know, three million dollars a year. They have two different branches. You know, two different branches, one in Europe and one in such and such place. Um, they, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you read all that without without saying what they sell or anything. And you should be like, oh, that's, you know, the chapstick company. I know that. Yes, this is their problem. And the reason I came up with it is most salespeople can't do that. What I learned is, and it's funny I use disparate systems, is I had a consulting client several years ago. And I'd sit in these pipeline meetings and I'd say, okay, what's the problem? And after a while, I got frustrated because they would just basically say the same problem about every single customer. They go, oh, they have disparate systems. 
And then I'd say, what's the problem with the next one? Oh, they have disparate systems. I'm like, well, how's this different than the other one? Well, they don't. It's not different. I'm like, it has to be different. It has to be different. It's not just disparate systems or they, it's not they can't communicate with first time buyers. You got to give me more than that. Like, what's the impact? And so when I learned that these guys were just basically skimming the surface and coming up with very high level, um, um, with some, with some high level bland problems, I realized, well, they're not digging deep enough. And the only way to dig deep enough and know you're digging deep enough is if you get the identifying information. And here's the closure on this, guys. So critical. No two deals can ever look exactly the same. Ever. Every single deal is completely different. So therefore, if they look the same in the in the CRM, you haven't gone deep enough. Yeah, I mean, every every buyer's got you know, their own personality, right? So they're they're all injecting their own predispositions towards their own challenges. And it's not it's not a you know every business challenge is not unique, or it, it is unique in the sense that you've got these unique personalities who are who are driving that. Is that kind of what you're getting at? No, just the opposite. So let's take two companies. Um, okay, wait. Um, how do I do this? John, are you married? I am, yet married with three kids. Okay. Kelly, are you married with kids? Yes. Okay. Let's just say you have three kids, right? So I can make you guys look as, as the same as possible, right? Let's say you both have three kids and you both um, live in the same neighborhood and you're both the same age and your wives are the same age. I want to make everything about you as, the same as possible, right? And you're looking to go on vacation, okay? And I'm selling you a vacation. Does that sound, does that sound all right? Yes. All right, perfect. Even though you guys are the same age with the same number of kids and the same genders of the kids and you have the same jobs and everything, at the end of the day, uh, it's still going to be different because John's and his wife, they're more interested in an in, in, uh, international vacation. You're more interested in a local vacation. Um you know, um, uh, what am I trying to say here? Um, the last time that John and his family went on a vacation was four years ago. The last time you went on a vacation was two years ago, Kelly. Kelly, right. your your mother just passed away and the family's really down. So you're looking to go on a vacation to get over the and, and move on from the difficult time with your with your mother passing. John, you want to go on vacation because you um, you just got this new job and you're super excited and you're celebrating and it's been a long time since you had this job because before this job, you guys were in a really difficult time financially and you hadn't gone on vacation in a long time. So do you guys see what I'm saying? Even no matter how much you look alike, you can never be the same. Yes. That's what I'm saying. So when you start to sell to companies, every one of them, if they're losing money, great. One's losing a million, one's losing 600,000. If they're losing customers, one is a 2% churn rate, another one is a 2.5% churn rate. It, it always, man, that's what I'm saying. It always manifests itself differently. And salespeople assume it manifests itself the same. And that's the problem. So if, if it's looking the same, if two opportunities are looking the same, then you haven't dug deep enough. Exactly. Bingo. And therefore, you can't quantify the gap. No two gaps will ever, ever be the same. Right. So, Keenan, um, if our listeners wanted to go and, and purchase your book, Gap Selling, where could they find it? Best place would be Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Well, Keenan, um, thank you so much. I think this, is, this concludes our podcast interview. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Keenan. All right. Y'all be good. If you found this interview interesting and want to learn more, go to hingemarketing.com and please give us a rating and review. And if you know of any research teams in Antarctica, tell them to tune in to the Visible Expert Podcast. Thanks for listening.